Alaska. Welcome to a special edition from Unalaska Community Television. Tonight we'll be airing uh, an interview that was taped earlier this past weekend with Senator Ted Stevens and our own Channel 8 broadcaster Mick Rohrbeck. We hope that you enjoy that. Following the interview will be a portion of the Senator's speech which he gave at the Swampsea meetings which took place again over this past weekend. So please stay tuned and enjoy the show. Roarback and I'm here with Senator Ted Stevens. He's visiting Unalaska this weekend as part of the Southwest Municipal Conference uh, meeting that's been here all weekend. Welcome, Senator Ted Stevens. Nice to be back again. It's good to see you. Okay, we, um, we wanted to ask him a, a few questions about um, some of the issues that are affecting uh, Alaskans and Unalaskans and uh, some of these things he touched on in his in his speech just a few moments ago, but uh, we'll go ahead and and uh, see if we can ask him some more questions. Uh, first of all, Senator, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the uh, Tongass National Forest with the <clears throat> consideration of all the environmental concerns these days. Why uh, why have there been reports of tree spiking uh, for the first time in Alaska's history in the Tongass National Forest? Well, you know, I think that's extremely unfortunate. There is a very extreme element that's uh, making a statement that they don't want any trees cut. And they they did uh, drive spikes in trees, and they did post th that they had driven them in trees. Uh, that is a trespass, and it's a violation of federal law, by the way. Uh, and one of uh, the loggers in the area that was authorized to be cutting trees uh, missed, I understand, one of those spikes by less than a foot. It would have killed him if he had hit it with a, one of those enormous chainsaws that they use. But it is a growing feeling of, of many people uh, in southeastern that there ought not to be any cutting of uh, trees from the Tongass, which I think is unfortunate because that's a, an area that was set aside to assure that there would be a supply of timber uh, to prevent privately owned timber areas uh, from uh, being undercut in order to increase the price of timber, particularly uh, uh, in, in terms of southeastern. It was also a commitment that was made by our government at the time the Japanese came out of World War II. We made a 50-year agreement uh, that they could cut timber down there. And it's uh, and they own that company that does cut the timber in that particular area. Okay, what about the, uh, what about the rainforest issue, though, and the, and the, and the environmental part of the... Uh, I guess we're talking about a greenhouse effect here, and, and, and why are uh, certain groups of people so upset uh, with this logging of, of the, uh, the largest remaining rainforest in, in North America? That's not so. It is not the largest one. As a matter of fact, it's really not a rainforest in the full sense of the word. It's certainly not a rainforest like the Brazilian rainforest. But beyond that, uh, the difference is, is that uh, in the Tongass, uh, we have set aside uh, uh, the, it was, uh, uh, I'm trying to think about the amount of, it's 5.4 million acres of timber area as wilderness. I mean, we had this battle in, in the period from 1973 to 1980, and while the industry opposed it uh, to a great extent, Congress did set aside, at first the request was for about a million two, uh, uh, an acreage set aside for, for in the Tongass for wilderness. That was increased to 2.7. The final amount was 5.4 million acres set aside, uh, timber areas set aside for wilderness. Outside of that area, the agreement was that the cutting cycle could continue. This is an enormous uh, area. The basic areas that were viewed as being rainforest were set aside as wilderness already including, by the way, Admiralty Island, which at one time was harvested for timber. And, and the regrowth there is such that most people think it is original stand, but it, it is not. It, it, it's second growth. It's second growth. And in some areas, second growth is better than the, than, than the uh, 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 mature forest, particularly the overaged uh, forest. Now, there's a great conflict uh, among the scientists, but uh, the Forest Service insists that the, it has protected the areas, uh, that are, are essential uh, for rainforest protection and, and, and wants to go ahead and, and, and can 
carry out the cutting cycle. And the cutting cycle on the remaining forest area is 110 years. It's not uh, clear cutting vast acreages. It's cutting very sp specific, uh, discrete areas each year. And, and, and they grow back so fast. I took a group of congressmen, senators to one area that had been cut five years ago, and they, they couldn't believe me when we told them to cut. But it is a, it is a difficult uh, issue for us because it has become symbolic, sort of an American attempt to, to prevent what's going on in Brazil. And, and there are two different situations. Brazil has not set aside a portion of its rainforest for protection. If it did, I think the rest of the world uh, would, would say as long as they were careful about having a sustained yield period, uh, that they ought to have some se selective harvesting of their, of their forest resources. But we have set aside a substantial portion of Tongass, and the rest of it is, will be cut over a 110-year period. But, uh, and as I said, there's regrowth. So that oh, sure. at no time is there going to be any substantial portion of the Tongass uh, that has been cut. Okay, maybe we should uh, actually focus on some of the issues that are more uh, pertinent to to your visit in, in, in our neighborhood here, or the southwest area of, of Alaska. And, and, and one thing that's on a lot of people's minds is the, uh, is the high seas uh, interception of salmon uh, by foreign fishing vessels. And uh, I, we, we were wondering if you could give us any um, of the latest details on on, uh, on the on the Taiwanese vessel in particular that was just uh, found to have a, a great deal of salmon on board. And, and, and is there any legislation that's uh, pending on this? Well, I think we're all familiar with what happened with that sting operation that was partially successful, at least in the last instance. The Taiwanese did take the people in custody. There are two people in American jails as a result of that operation trying to stop the, uh, the illegal sale of uh, immature salmon harvested in the high seas by the, by the Taiwanese drift net fleet. The Taiwanese government did initial, uh, did sign and formally enter into the, the agreement that was initialed by their uh, negotiators earlier. We do have an agreement now with uh, Taiwan for this year under the drift net act. Uh, that does give us 100% uh, uh, coverage as far as the Taiwanese votes in terms of the transmitters on board and we will have uh, uh, some observer coverage. Not enough, but some. It doesn't achieve really the goal of, uh, of a commitment to eliminate drift nets, but it shows they're willing to work with us. Uh, Korea has not done that instantly, and if they don't do something by next Tuesday uh, to, to come in compliance, they will be subject to sanctions under the Drift Net Act, which we hope will be substantial, but unfortunately Congress has limited those sanctions to products of the sea. But I, I think that we, there can be some meaningful sanctions there. Uh, as far as uh, further legislation is concerned, uh, we are looking at tightening up the Drift Net Act and see if we can't make it more uh, 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 capable of bringing about the result we seek, which is uh, the elimination of the drift nets. Okay. Um, what, what do you think, uh, what, what, what are your views uh, right now with the, uh, on the conflict that we have between shore base and offshore uh, processing companies, and uh, and do you do you see any compromise for these two different? We we've got quite a. Well, I I think it's unfortunate that the state did not move to establish the facilities and the inducements to bring the processing ashore in the beginning. I was just I just reminded this uh, this uh, gathering here uh, at Clem Tillian when he was the advisor of the governor of Alaska tried to set up a a program whereby that would come about, and he envisioned an expansion of the dock and airport facilities here and at, uh, at Cold Bay and at Kodiak and, and having a, a total plan to attract the, this processing ashore. Uh, it did not happen, and there was a need, so it's been met by private enterprise converting vessels. You know, we had to close that loophole, but first there were vessels that were foreign built, now they have to be U.S. built. But in any event, uh, there's a substantial conversion going on. We're seeing part of the uh, tuna fleet come up here. You've seen that. They're, they've been uh, uh, modified. Uh, we have other vessels coming in, and there's going to be a substantial portion of the fleet that will be uh, a floating uh, processing uh, have floating processing function. Some will be actually harvesting and processing uh, uh, simultaneously. Uh, that is presents an just an extreme conflict with the existing onshore industry 
and with the vessels that don't have the capability of processing or which are not tied into that floating processing capability. Uh, I do believe that the council, the regional council, should have the authority to allocate among the types of gear involved both processing and harvesting gear in order to prevent collisions and in particular to prevent overfishing and overutilization of the species. We, our first goal ought to be to protect the, the species themselves, to assure their reproduction, uh, to not allow harvesting in excess of the, the optimum sustained yield uh, that we must uh, maintain. And I, I, I uh, uh, am of the opinion, however, that Congress won't legislate that. Congress may allow us to uh, expand the powers of the Regional Council to achieve that, and that's what we're trying to work out when we get back to the reauthorization of the Magnuson Act this year. The Re Magnuson Act will be uh, subject to reauthorization year this year, and uh, and we have some tough problems, as I pointed out to the, the meeting here, and uh, the, the worst of which is uh, the the new demand we've heard now from the members of the House of Representatives from Oregon and Washington that two additional seats be added to the Regional Council, uh, the North Pacific Regional Council, and that they be allocated to Washington and Oregon. Uh, that would completely upset the balance in that council and, and would have a long-range uh, detrimental effect on Alaska's fisheries. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, in your speech, you mentioned uh, energy and uh, the oil, price of oil and some of these things. Uh, uh, of course, these are all uh, issues right now what with uh, Exxon and, and all that going on. There was a, some time ago there was a study done here uh, on, on Alaska Island at, at Makushin Volcano uh, to see whether or not a geothermal uh, plant was, was a feasible thing. It was decided that it wasn't feasible. Um, how do you feel about, about geothermal energy and, and, and you think there's any Well, I don't know whether change. this one would be feasible in terms of the price, the alternative price of fuels now. Uh, that could be reviewed again. I, I believe that generally geothermal uh, capability has, has been uh, uh, on the upswing. I know in California there's a substantial accretion of new energy uh, plants there that are based on the geothermal concept. And they've come in through the private sector. They've been privately financed because they are they are uh, economically sound. And uh, there is, uh, I believe, geothermal potential in Alaska that is economically sound and ought to be pursued. I was trying to tell the conference that I, I believe that the cost of maintaining the floating processors will increase substantially in the future due to the price of energy. That we have an inducement to bring uh, processing plants ashore and keep them here in terms of uh, the, the uh, hydroelectric capacity and the geothermal capacity, the onshore alternative sources uh, of, of energy. We have, for instance, half the coal of the world. Most people don't realize that. No, half the coal, uh, uh, half the coal of the United States, 25% of the coal of the world is in Alaska. We, it, it, is, it would be possible to have coal-fired plants eventually onshore uh, to, that would run at substantially less cost to Alaskans than using uh, uh, petroleum products. Right. Uh, where, as the world price of oil continues to increase, their uh, coal is going to become more and more uh, the, the fuel of the future, particularly as the technology for clean coal I I increases. And, and I think that uh, that, again, is something you won't find many floating processors that are going to be able to carry coal uh, and, and process fish, but you could have onshore plants that would be coal-fired. I do believe we ought to have a strategy being developed to, to have offer an inducement in terms of energy to bring those uh, uh, processing facilities ashore. Right. We, uh, we however, uh, here in, in uh, the Alaska area are, are uh, dependent still on, on petroleum for our generation, you know, system. But, uh, however, coal is not here either. I mean, we it would have to be. No, there's some coal along the chain. Some, but not not really enough. I don't I don't really. Think. Well, there's coal at Beluga, and there's coal that's right across the inlet from Anchorage, and there's coal somewhere out towards uh, 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 Sand Point. There's one of those islands that has coal uh, there. It's not a very high grade, but there's coal there. But again, I'm, it doesn't matter where, where you get it. Coal is going to be less expensive than oil, and and, and when it's less expensive. If you have facilities onshore that have dual capability, for instance, the ability to bring oil or coal, 
you're going to have an advantage over the, the processing plant that's floating that can only burn oil. In Canada, I don't know if you know this, in Canada, particularly in eastern Canada, every plant onshore must have the capability of burning at least two fuels, gas and coal, coal and, and, and uh, uh, fuel oil, or fuel oil or gas. So you've, got, you've got to have two, two ability to use two different uh, sorts of, uh, of sources of energy if you're going to build a, a massive uh, uh, energy plant in Canada and the East Coast. Now, I think we ought to have something similar to that along the chain. But we ought to have more onshore capability based upon the lower price of energy in the long run. Okay. Um, President Bush uh, made the statement that saving the uh, remaining wetlands was a was a, an issue for him, was a priority for him. What what suggestions might you be able to make for Unalaskans here uh, who who see local wetland areas as being damaged or destroyed? What what steps can we take right here in our community uh, to protect some of these areas? Well, I think we have to be very militant in trying to protect the loss of wetlands where they're critical to our our marine life and our migratory waterfowl in particular. That's uh, the emphasis that uh, really is essential to keep in mind. I, we have 60% of the nation's wetlands, but the wetlands that are interior uh, to Alaska are, you know, back uh, from the shoreline are really of significance in terms of the migratory water uh, fowl and, and, and the wildlife. Where you have a uh, loss of, of, uh, of uh, wetlands in a community area, I think the thing that you can do is to try and insist that the existing facilities be upgraded rather than having them just be abandoned and left to decay and move on to another area. That's what's been the tradition, by the way, of the chain. You can look at the areas along the chain when industry reaches a point of decay instead of rehabilitating old facilities, they move on. We have a current uh, dispute here right now that involves uh, the, uh, the Corps of Engineers and one of the plants is trying to expand uh, and it is seeking to replace a dock that was built in World War II. Uh, I think there should be a different consideration for that as compared to someone who wants to build a dock in a completely new area and leave that old area be abandoned. In my opinion, the people of the area ought to insist that the Corps of Engineers, the federal agencies, work with people who are trying to upgrade, modernize, and replace existing facilities and to use those facilities in lieu of of destroying additional wetland areas. So that's what I think local people should be concentrating on. I got to tell you, I got to catch a plane. Right. Okay. Um, I want to thank you. <coughs> yeah. My friend behind the camera, did I answer your questions? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have to make sure before I get out of here okay. to accomplish my objective. We, we've been talking with Senator Ted Stevens, and um, we want to thank him for being here and coming up to the Channel 8 studios uh, once again and, and uh, talking with us here for. Channel 8. So, Thanks. Thank, thank you. Appreciate for it very yeah. much. I, I wouldn't, you know, my son's out here in a boat, and I only see him once in a while, so I, I cross paths with him, but I want to go out and say hello before I leave. All right. Okay. Thank, okay. You. thank right. you. Keep watching. Yes. Uh, Senator Stevens, despite uh, the growing dependence on foreign oil, many Bristol Bay fishermen are still afraid of oil development out on the fishing grounds, especially after the Exxon incident. They would support a buyback of the sale 92 leases. Um, would you support a buyback? And what do you think the chances are for a buyback and pass in the Senate? No, I would not support a buyback, at least not yet. I said I would support a buyback if there was proof that the Exxon Valdez had, had damaged a species in terms of reproductive capability. And, and we have no such proof yet. Uh, I, I, we have 80% of the outer continental shelf. And, and whether we like it or not, either during our lifetime or our children's lifetime, that is going to be explored as this nation becomes more dependent on Alaska's warehouse of, of natural resources. The statistics released last week showed that in the South 48, the recoverable projections of, of oil and gas have declined substantially. But in Alaska, the projections are there's even an increase in, in the recoverable oil and gas. Uh, a great part of that is offshore, and that 80% that of the outer continental shelf 
that's off our state. And, and if we can delay this type of, of exploration now, but to the extent that we do, it will mean that when it comes, and it most assuredly will come, it will come in the most hurried, uh, stampede type of, of exploration uh, that you can imagine. It will be totally inconsistent with the preservation of, of our, our marine resources if it comes in that way. Now, now this sale in particular is one that I know a great deal about. In, in response to a request that came from Bristol Bay, I went to the Secretary of Interior and, and asked that no drilling take place in Bristol Bay. The original Bristol Bay sale was modified. 83% of the area that was originally included in the notification of sale was deleted. We have an agreement that if this exploration could go ahead, there will be no exploration in Bristol Bay, even if there's a discovery in this North Aleutian Shelf area. The North Aleutian Shelf area is 20 miles offshore. It was drawn in a way to assure that there's a corridor for migrating salmon coming in and going out, and it's more than 100 miles from the entrance uh, to the, the, the spawning ground. Now, even if there's a discovery there, and it's, it's estimate that, uh, estimated that it's not going to be, uh, it's not a large field, even if there is a discovery, uh, they, they, what they got an estimate, I think, of a half a billion barrel potential. Uh, there will be a series of wells drilled that would probably have a capacity of somewhere around 500 barrels a day each. Uh, we're not looking at a potential of a spill that's associated with an Exxon Valdez kind of spill. And we're not, as a matter of fact, there has never been an incident in the history of the United States in which fishery resources were damaged because of offshore oil spills. Uh, I can't uh, responsibly uh, tell the fishermen of this area or any other area that I can go back and support a policy of prohibition against an industry I know is going to develop in the national interest based upon a fear that's not based on facts. Now, this fear is not based on facts. I have supported a moratorium and will continue to support the moratorium until we get the results of the Exxon Valdez. If, if there is a change in the data, and NOAA is studying that very carefully, as you know, and we're monitoring that almost on a monthly basis, if there is any indication that the fishery resources have been damaged by the Exxon Valdez, then when we, we will reconsider, I will reconsider this. But at the present time, the moratorium is there. The Chuck G. C. incidentally is going ahead uh, because in that case, the company came forward with a very responsive plan for, for uh, dealing with any emergency during the drilling period. Incidentally, we went through this in terms of Yakutat. I don't know how many of you had anything to do with the Akitat drilling uh, phase. For years, we just had this total opposition in, in the Akitat area to any exploration. Finally, after three court cases, the drilling went ahead. They drilled two wells. It was dry, and they left. Now, I don't know whether that's going to happen in, in the North Lucian Shelf area or not, but I know that in the final analysis, ultimately, if the federal government wants to have that area explored, it will be explored. But if it's not explored under the current agreement that I negotiated, I want to remind you, there will be drilling in Bristol Bay. Now that I can't seem to get across. We do have an agreement under this that that area that's to be leased will be limited to the 17% in the North Aleutian Shelf area, and there will be no drilling in Bristol Bay. If that's off, it's, if it's bar, when it comes back at us again, they'll drill where they want to drill. And I don't think we should pass that uh, on to our kids. And, and I say that advisedly. I, I'm not going to support a policy of prohibition that won't work. And it won't work in terms of preventing the federal government from drilling in the 80% area any more than it would work back in the 29th period of preventing Americans from drinking booze. It, they're going to drill for oil. Now, we have 80% of that area where they must drill for oil. So I think we should do it rationally and under scheduled environmental procedures. Incidentally, the other part of that agreement I negotiated was, if there is a discovery, there will be another environmental impact statement required under this procedure. At that time, it will be determined what steps have to be taken to, to mitigate any potential harm uh, to the Bristol Bay fishery. And if it's determined that you can't prevent harm to the Bristol Bay fishery, production will not be allowed. 
Now, I don't know how they could have been more fair to us under these circumstances, and I continue to be extremely disturbed at the state for having prevented that one exp exploration well from being drilled. I think it should be drilled. If it's dry, this is all over. And incidentally, just what, how many miles is it? There three wells were drilled up there by Falls Pass. They were all dry on shore. So this is an issue that ought not to, uh, to divide us. And also, it ought to be an issue that we, we demand be pursued on the basis of agreements that are the maximum attainable protections we can get for the fishery resources. I think we got that in this agreement. Now, I know you disagree, probably 99% of you, but I've got an idea. If you were in my seat, you would agree with what I have to do. Because I think we have to protect the area as a whole and protect the concept that development should not take place except after full consultation with us and, and under the, the most extreme protections we can get as far as the resource base is concerned. Hello and welcome back. We hope that you found that interesting and informative. Now we'd like you to stay tuned for Flash on Alaska, Alaska's only live news show brought to you every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. by Unalaska Community Television. So stay tuned, and we hope that you can perhaps even guess the question of the week.